Hello, and welcome to your brief talk on sympathetic magic. So I always think this topic is a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, it is a little bit dated, so do understand that. But uh, sympathetic magic gives us some insight into rites and rituals, right? So according to religion in general, there is the idea of a myth. Now, when we say myth, we mean a narrative that's explanatory, right? An explanatory narrative goes together well. If this, then that. Because of this, that. So when we deal with these ideas, there is a concept that if we understand the myth, we create a ritual based upon that myth. The myth explains the ritual, but if the ritual is done correctly, there is an expected outcome. So if we do X, then Y will happen. Well, sympathetic magic is a, a term that's coined by a fellow from the early part of the 20th century, and his name is James Frazier. He was quite fascinated with non-Western religions, uh, and so he studied a lot of the indigenous cultures. Now, understand that what he's going to talk about, again, very dated. When we talk about history, we are supposed to look at it with the lens of objectivity. Uh, we do not have to agree with the stance of the time, but understand that at that time, this was the stance, this was the belief. But Fraser, as he studied indigenous cultures, really kind of went against what a lot of very Victorian Western ideals expressed when it came to uh, primal tribal and indigenous religions. Basically, the overall view of these religions was not very pleasant. So the religions were superstitious. Um, they were nonsense, right? Um, the tribes would go crazy if uh, something odd happened or if a person of a different color showed up. I mean, these were very exaggerated stereotypes, and that is unfortunate. Frazier studied these indigenous cultures and he said, now, wait a minute. I don't think this is hooey. I don't think this is crazy. I don't think this is nonsense. He basically coined the term sympathetic magic to explain the belief in the ritual. Now, when I again say sympathetic magic, not prestidigitation, we are talking if this, then that. And that's why it's called sympathetic magic. So the universe, if you want to think about it this way, is sympathetic to you. Uh, so it, it sees what you're doing. What you're doing creates the result. Okay. So one of the best examples that I have of sympathetic magic is the Ashanti doll. Right? So these are from the Ghana region. And the idea is that if a woman wants to have a child, that she will get one of these dolls, carve it, uh, and she will carry it with her. And as you can see, this particular item, sorry, sweetie, there we go, uh, actually has the earrings and necklace uh, of a child, right? Uh, they are dressed, uh, they participate with the family. Um, it's a very elaborate ritual. But the idea is that the sympathy, the sympathetic magic part, is if I show the universe what I want, I want a child. And what I love about this is that in particular, it's a female child. Uh, so that kind of breaks with some of the cultures that really emphasize male children. So here, I want a daughter, right? I want a child. Um, and what happens is when the woman does get pregnant, she does give birth. Uh, the Ashanti doll is passed on to that child to play with in order to understand uh, family dynamics. Uh, so it goes from uh, kind of that universal uh, totem of sorts, uh, trying to draw that energy of fertility, of intent, uh, to then becoming a learning tool. And I just think that's fantastic. But I am going to put her down because... I don't want any babies, so uh, I'm good. I've got pugs. That's, that's plenty, I assure you. So, again, if I carry the Ashanti doll, then I will become pregnant. Okay. 
Well, Frazier further defines this, and he does a great job with it. There are a lot of categories. We're just going to talk about three. Those categories are productive, adversive, and contagious. Now, before I go into my talk completely, let me say I am not advocating that you do any of these things. I just am illustrating with some examples of very popular ideologies. So productive magic is attempting to produce something. So really, the Ashanti dog could be a very good example of that. There are stories of um, indigenous cultures uh, post uh, Western contact in which the uh, men would go out and plant a field and the women uh, on the night of the full moon would go out into the field uh, holding up what they described as brooms essentially and they would hop in the field and of course folks are like well that's unusual but it's not really because women represent fertility right from the body of a woman new life springs so from the body of the earth crop spring uh, and in addition to that you have the idea that uh, the full moon is the peak of that feminine power, right? The moon is associated with women. Uh, it's also associated with life and death because the moon goes through cycles. Women go through cycles. Uh, and of course, women are associated with childbirth, which brings a person into the world, but also introduces them to the concept of death. So they're life and death bringers. The broom is the sympathetic part because the brooms back in this time period were made from the remnants, the parts of the plants that you couldn't eat. Uh, so the discards of, let's say, uh, the prior uh, harvest. So the sympathetic part is, you know, look at this broom. Uh, it is what you are. Um, hop, hopping in the field, right? We want you to grow up, we want you to grow quickly, and we want you to grow tall. I always tell this story in my face-to-face -face classes that I actually once tried to grow, believe it or not, corn in Florida. Florida is not really good for corn, if you don't know that, uh, at least not my part of Florida. We have very acidic soil. Uh, and so when I planted my little kernels, what I got was a corn plant that was, you know, about yay tall. And by golly, it did bloom. That was really cool. Uh, but the cob that it produced, and it produced one cob, and there was only one survivor of the crop, uh, essentially had four kernels on it. If you are an indigenous culture and you are aware of nature around you and you are dependent upon nature and you have a great understanding of that dependence, four kernels isn't going to hold you long. So you want these plants to be full and luscious and healthy and bountiful. The second type of magic is adversive magic. So this is something like a curse or a hex. In ancient Egypt, they used to carve the image of their enemies in wax, and they would hold it underwater with the idea that if we drown this waxen image, then our enemy too shall come to an end. Contagious magic is doing something to part of X to affect all of X. So one of the best examples is the love potion. So there's a story that says you should follow someone that you like, and you scoop up a footprint that they leave behind. And you mix that soil that produces the footprint with some potting soil and you plant a seed in there. And so as the seed grows, so too will their love for you. And I always find that kind of funny because I'm like, well, what happens if it turns out they're really terrible and you don't like them anymore? Do you just put some weed killer on that plant? Don't do this, don't do it. But anyway, kind of an interesting little side story. So you might consider something along those lines. If we see a penny that's heads up on the sidewalk, what do we do? The ritual is we pick it up because what do we expect to happen? We expect to have good luck, right? Okay, so that having been said, I'm going to encourage you to look through the rest of this module. Make sure you don't have any questions and I will catch you on the other side of that grading window. Have a good one.